Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 116. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank everyone who has liked, shared, commented, has provided us feedback, subscribes to the show. All that support allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. I also want to take this time to thank our sponsors. Samson Equipment has been providing uncompromising quality for over 40 years. Samson products are long lasting and made of the highest quality equipment on the market. Each project is built from the ground up with the ability to customize every need. The team at Samson focuses on developing the highest quality relationships with their customers, in addition to providing them unparalleled quality in every piece of equipment bearing the Samson name. Learn more about Samson's professional weight room solutions and the Samson standard at samsonequipment.com. Also want to thank our sponsor, Cerberus Strength. Cerberus is an organization that puts the athlete first and actively works towards providing the best quality gear at an affordable price. Owned and operated by active lifters, Cerberus has quickly evolved into a global brand symbolizing quality and trust. So if you're in the market for the highest quality strength and conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to check out CerberusStrength.com and use promo code STRENGTH underscore GAME to receive an extra 10% off your next order. Also want to thank our sponsor, Sport Kilt. Born in Scotland and stitched in America, Sport Kilt offers the highest quality custom kilts and accessories. Every Sport Kilt is made in the USA of machine washable polyester blend fabric, offering an alternative to the traditional heavy wool kilt. Check out the No Pants All Glory selection of kilts and shop the best collection of high quality American made sport kilts and accessories at sportkilt.com and use our promo code TSG to receive an extra 10% off your next order. And in this week's episode, I am joined by Mason Baggett. Mason is the assistant strength conditioning coach for football at the University of Maryland. He returned to College Park to work with the Terps football program after previously serving as an associate director of football strength conditioning for five seasons from 2016 to 2021. Most recently, he was the head strength coach for the Nevada football team for two seasons and the assistant coach for the University of Oregon football team for one season the year prior. Baggett started his career at his alma mater, Virginia Tech, as a graduate assistant strength conditioning coach from 2006 to 2008. He also garnered experience as an intern strength coach at the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado in 2007, before moving into his first full-time role as an assistant strength coach at East Carolina University. Working with the ECU from 2008 to 2011, he then transitioned into a tactical coaching role, working as a strength conditioning coach with the 2nd Marine Special Operations Battalion in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina from 2011 to 2015. He then returned to college football as an associate strength coach at the University of Illinois from 2015 to 2016 before landing at his first stint with the Terps. Baggett is a former college football player playing on the offensive line for Virginia Tech from 2002 to 2006. Following his college playing career, he continued to stay active and involved with performance and training. He competed in powerlifting as well as strongman from 2003 to 2011, attending his first powerlifting competition during in-season football at VT. His competitive edge has not left and he still continues to train and hosts an in-house competition with the strength staff members at the end of every fall. Like I said, I'm excited to have him on the show today. So with all that said, let's get in the game with Coach Mason Baggett. What's going on, everybody? Today, I'm excited. We've got Coach Mason Baggett on the show. How are you doing today, Coach? 
I'm doing awesome, Coach. Appreciate you having me on. Hey, I appreciate you taking some time today. I know uh, as we record this, you're in the you're in the thick of everything uh, with summer football camp. So, I mean, to get you to get you on the back end of a long day, I, I appreciate your time coming on the show today. Yeah, no worries. I'm kind of looking at my little picture right here, and it looks like I've got a good outdoor tan going on. So <laughs> I feel like I've I've spent plenty of time in the last month and a half outside. Hey, that's perfect. I mean, it beats right now. Like over here in Florida, it's just dumping rain. So the the more you can kind of get out and get some sun, I mean, I'm jealous. But I know it's been it's hot. It's a benefit of the job, right? Yeah, benefit of the job being on your feet, being outside, getting a little, you know, stealing some steps in every once in a while. So yeah, while we're in the middle of training. So definitely appreciate that. Oh, that's perfect. Hey, well, I know we're going to hop into a lot of training stuff and kind of get up going into like what your new rule and stuff looks like nowadays. Uh, but really kind of want to go back to the beginning and get started with what really got you involved into sports and like training and like what to your leading up to what you're kind of currently doing to stay active and train, like going from your football career on now as a coach. Sure. Uh, I mean, so I guess like all the way back, I've always played multiple sports, um, you know, three to four a year up through high school and then had an opportunity to, to walk on, and play football at Virginia Tech and, and a couple of other places. And, um, you know, it was a true walk-on. I had been recruited at some small schools for for athletics, for wrestling uh, and football, and I had gotten hurt my senior year. And back then I had a couple of scholarship offers that got dropped uh, for some now FCS schools, one double A back then. Um, and so I just decided to go to a bigger school and walk on. And, and if football didn't work, I was going to try to get on the wrestling team. But, um, you know, I think training for those sports throughout my life was a, you know, just a big part of, you know, being an athlete. And I got into the weight room at Virginia Tech and was really fortunate to be in a program run by Mike Gentry, who spent almost 30 years at Virginia Tech with Frank Beamer and was really successful, but also was one of the pioneers in strength and conditioning. And Really, to his credit, he kind of steered my passion a little bit. And I didn't think I wanted to be a strength coach or a coach, for that matter, for a long time. I thought I wanted to be in medicine or sports medicine or, you know, so something in that area. I went to, you know, my undergrad's exercise science, I call it now, but it was essentially pre-med. Um, but he saw my passion for the weight room and, you know, I had to put on weight for football and, you know, being a true walk-on, that was really where, most of us that, that are in that situation, we use the weight room as kind of the, you know, the ability to kind of get us to where we want to go. So I, I remember very distinctly, it was the fall of 2003. I was on the practice squad and there was a training partner. who was another scout team guy that was not, not traveling um, in the middle of the season. Coach Gentry's like, hey, you guys should just go sign up for this powerlifting meet in Richmond, Virginia. And literally – that's where I, that's where I am ra was raised and grew up in Richmond. And uh, so he's like, Hey, there's this AAU powerlifting meet and you can sign up for juniors. So you get like the 20 to 23 age group. And so literally the, it was an away game. We signed up for this meet, drove to stay with my parents in Richmond and competed in this AAU meet over a Saturday in a, bi in, a in a, in an away week in season football and like competed in, in a three event powerlifting meet. And so like, that's kind of where it started. It was like, I, was a meathead at heart, loved training, loved doing extra for football, kind of loved everything that came with college football. But, you know, that that was like an outlet. It was like that that was I feel like that's unheard of these days to push kids to go compete in season and something else. But it was just right, right couple guys, right, you know, population, whatever. And so that sparked it once once I got done with playing, I actually kept some weight on and continued to compete in powerlifting. Another one of the straight coaches on the Olympic side at Virginia Tech, Terry Mitchell, um, competed in full powerlifting meets, but was also a bench press specialist. Um, and so learned a little bit from him, competed in a couple meets with him, and then got on a staff at, at East Carolina where my eyes got open to strongman training, competing in strongman, still competing in uh, local and regional meets in powerlifting. We did the – there's a there was a powerlifting meet in North Carolina called the Battle on the Border – and uh, the battle on the border was essentially North Carolina versus South Carolina. And people from all over came to it, but you were put on teams. And so you accrued points for, you know, lifting in your categories and was fortunate to like 
be competitive against some pretty well well known powerlifters in that that time frame in that area. Um, held a couple records with with, uh, with the Battle on the Border a few years and won it one year and just had a really fun time competing with us. I, I just fell into fell in love with it because we had a staff that was really into training and competing together. Um, you know, and that that kind of just took it that way further on. And I and although I have not competed in a few in, in a number of years now. Every fall, typically the staff that I'm on, there's at least a group of us, if not the entire staff, will train in the end season when we have a little bit more time to train and do a full meet, Olympic meet, strongman meet, uh, powerlifting meet at the end of the fall, right around Thanksgiving time frame together, just to have something to train for and towards. So super fun, but that's kind of the long and short of it. I, I fell into coaching, you know, in, in a different manner, but the training I think would have still been a part of anything that I do, no matter what field I, I landed in. Yeah, that's really cool too. And like, obviously like Mike Gentry being at Virginia Tech was a huge staple. And like, I remember seeing him, I think pretty young in my career too, like when they put on a conference around the area and he was speaking too. And I think uh, Coach Kaz spoke that day. I'm trying to remember who else like spoke that day, but like seeing him speak was, was pretty cool. And I, like at the time, I didn't know who he was like too well. And then everybody was like in awe of him. And I started doing like more research after I was like, this is definitely someone you need to know. And it was, I think it must've been closer like to like towards the end of his career as he was starting to get into like that kind of that AD role and like was passing the torch, I think off to like one of his other protégés to like start working football a little bit more and him take a back seat, But still he's he's a wealth of knowledge and that's that's a pretty cool thing to be able to kind of be brought up in that like unknowingly that you were around someone that was so prolific in the in the field and and yeah you're definitely you're definitely right like it's it's cool to see like practice squad players or or other guys like just start being like super competitive in season and i don't know if I don't know how if you're going to be able to get away doing a powerlifting meet like when the team is away any, anymore, but no. definitely, definitely a cool thing that you can do. So, I mean, how do you how do you kind of keep that competitiveness like going? Like, I know we'll get into football, too, but like this, is it just seems like perfect time to ask this, like football teams are so big and you do have like so many different roles within the group that inevitably some players are not going to be traveling. Some players are going to be walk on. Some people are going to be red shirts. Like there's so many missing like pieces that are going on. Even if you have five coaches, like how do you kind of keep guys like engaged and competitive, almost like you were like being on the practice squad that first year and do something like that when, when they're not going to see the field, like there's, there's not going to be much playing time for them. How do you keep them engaged on such a big squad when they feel like, maybe their role is like less significant than, than the starting lineup. I think that's a huge area that might get overlooked because I think that especially in today's times, you, you recruit players with the understanding that a lot of them are going to be competitive. You know, they want to play immediately. They want to compete immediately. And the reality of it is on a roster of 125 or so, you know, with 85 scholarships, you know, not everybody can travel based on the rules of the, each conference. So you know that not everybody's going to play, but I think that's a really harsh reality that if you're not prepared for it, when that time hits and, you know, you've trained from January all the way through August, through, through fall camp, and that time comes for, you know, the practice squad or, you know, what we call the developmental you know, group where they're going to come in extra days throughout the week and train and, and get, continue development. I think it's all about how you sell it. I think there have been times and programs that I've been a part of that, that has felt like punishment to players instead of an opportunity to continue to develop where you've got to, you've got to utilize that time. And I think there's a way to make that training relevant to, to make it something that has an element of fun in it where they understand that it's, it's beneficial to them but also that it's not all fun. We have to train, but it's, it's within the realm of you've got, you know, 12 opportunities, just like there's 12 weeks and 12 game weeks of the season, give or take bye weeks, whatever, to get better and get a leg up on the guys that you want to compete against. And you don't know when your time comes. So I think it's, it's trying to say, Hey, this is an extra opportunity in the week that 
it could be next man up any week. It could be a guy that's third string that's kind of developmental. That's a younger guy. And I think there, there are ways that one, you keep consistency in the training. I, I'm a big believer in just consistency. Uh, I don't think there, if there was ever a magic bean to anything, it's just staying consistent, doing the basics brutally well, be, being able to harp in on technique, being able to continue and make, make, Use progressive overload as a great tool. I know that we have really smart strength coaches and you've had the ability to have this podcast with some really bright minds on it. And I think a lot of guys would agree that the the most basic tenet of strength conditioning, utilizing progressive overload and having a really smart progression for guys to just continue to see improvement. When you document and show and share improvement to your student athletes, that is the the biggest motivator, I think, because they see that they're actually getting better. And now technology has made it even easier to give instant feedback with bar speeds. And, you know, Tendo units have been around for 25 plus years. So you've been able to use a Tendo to give feedback, but you have, you know, some of these products now have a tablet and it shows, you know, it shows immediate, whatever numbers, wattage speeds, whatever you want to see. And so you can use those, those pieces just for competitiveness too, amongst individuals and the group. Um, and so I think keeping some of those elements in there gives it the, you know, it feels like fun if they're doing a jump test and, you know, they're trying to out jump each other, or it feels like fun if you're calling out, you know, times, even if you're running on your speed day with, you know, 10 yard split, something that might not be something that's too dangerous to run year round, but it, it's something that gets the intent up and it, it kind of drives the element of competitiveness. And I think you find ways to provide feedback really consistently and it just, one, it drives intent, and two, it keeps that competitiveness up. And I think that's where you have to know, learn your players, know your players, create relationships, and know what drives them, and try to harp on those those areas. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like that, that feedback is super important, and and selfishly too, like being able to provide it individually for that athlete because everybody, everybody that's in that developmental part of like the program. Like some of them might think they shouldn't be there. Some of them think they're better. Some of them are injured. Like, and they that's just kind of how the chips fell when it came to in season. Some of them are maybe good enough. There's just there's just a slew of people in front of them, right. and they, they're just yep. not going to make it. So at that point in time, like you you do want to show progress, and you want to be super individual with how you're showcasing them and you're providing them feedback because that's what's going to kind of keep them motivated in that time where they're maybe not contributing on the field, but they can find other ways to be ready if they're the next man called up. Like absolutely. on the flip side of that too, like you start dealing with athletes that have like been in the program for a long time and you're kind of keeping them motivated. I know you can kind of keep the same mentality with them and like kind of keep them prepared, but how do you almost like reel some of these guys in too and like make sure that, the main focus stays the main focus. Like when you get to the level like where you're playing high division one football, like some of these guys and like NIL deals and like draft stock and all that stuff. And just like game, like you're, you want them to like still be playing for the team, but at the same time, like you got to find ways to like keep them motivated and reel them in. How do you kind of have like those one-on-one -on -one conversations with guys? Like if they're just weight room freaks or like they're really good on the field and you have to like pull them back so that they save it like a, like a caged dog for like game day. Yeah. That's a really good question too, because you know, you're up and down the spectrum. I, I think I thought you were going a little bit different way and asking about more like motivating some of like the star players, but this is a, it's a, it's another unique area where I think the relationship is everything. Knowing, knowing the guys, knowing what motivates them, knowing really what they expect out of training, and as the coach, knowing what you expect the training to do for them. And I think over-communicating that or consistently communicating that and co communicating the expectation. I mean, even in our, our off-season period right now, we have a couple days that might be a speed day in the weight room, and I've got guys that don't understand that a speed day – doesn't need to include a 405 back squat, even for some of my guys that, you know, can throw that away to round. And I'm looking at, you know, speeds on, on our, our BBT and they could probably hit the zones that we're asking them to. But, you know, I think for feedback purposes, I'm telling them what the bigger picture is. I'll say, look, this is week four, week five. 
this is where we're trying to get to. We're we're gonna we're gonna decrease these speeds later on, or we have another day on Friday where we're actually gonna put weight on the barbell, and I don't care what that feedback mechanism looks like. I don't care what the what the number is on the squat. I just want to see big weight moving, and I want to see you be able to, to to actually stimulate some muscle growth or stimulate some strength growth from these areas. But I think really communicating what your intent is for that day again then drives and i think for the more mature players who can handle that i think they appreciate that and i think that's almost to me like a a more mature relationship because i think when you have players that have been in the program a longer time it's not just like shut up and do the work i think you have to share the 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 vision of the program and what the intent is and not everybody will agree with me on this but i really believe i'm almost like a a hyper educator in the weight room now that doesn't mean that i i don't get after my guys or get up somebody's ass when they need to, or, or like, it's not the motivational side, but it is the way that I truly believe that if you want somebody bought in, they need to understand what they're doing it for. And I think we can all agree. A lot of us in, at the collegiate realm that, you know, if we want to be really good at our jobs, one, we need to have really good recruiting departments surrounding us and great recruiting coaches to get us the right talent, but we're not training weightlifting teams. And if we're doing it, as if we're operating as coaches that are trying to train great weightlifters, then we have the whole thing wrong. But I think sharing the vision of what the training is doing for our athletes is the biggest motivator you can have. And a little bit of belief and understanding in the program goes a long way. They don't have to know the science behind it, but I might over communicate what this science part of it is or dumb it down a little bit and give them uh, you know, a quick shot of, Hey, this is what we're doing it for. This is what we're trying to stimulate. This is what we're trying to, to affect for two weeks down the line for, you know, next week for, Hey, th- this is going to really fatigue you for going into the next week, but the intent still needs to be here these next two weeks. And you're going to feel beat up going into these next few workouts. But I still need, if you're coming in the 80%, I need all of that 80% when you come in. So I think, especially for a more mature athlete or even somebody who's older, who might just be a little bit quote unquote over it. I think more, more is more. You know, more, more, more education is more in that, in that sense. And it has the ability to kind of push the, push your, your intent for the training even further. Yeah. That's uh, I think, I mean, to tie it all up too, it's just, it's like you said, the relationships too, and like knowing how to have those conversations with those individuals. And I think that's awesome. Like sharing the vision and knowing that, Hey, maybe, maybe this athlete wants to know more and like kind of peek behind the curtain but they actually want right. to know the science side of it. That's fine. If they want to know like the big picture and like know where this training session falls within like the scope of like our summer ball, or if they want to know within the season, like, Hey, why we're doing this type of movement, like two days before a game or why we're doing this the day after a game, like educating them is, is never going to be a bad thing to do. And you, you give them more of kind of ownership over the program too when they're and they're going to be bought into a lot more when they understand that like you're not just throwing stuff at a wall to see if it sticks like there's actually yeah. purpose and there's intent behind what it is so when you ask them to do something difficult it's not because I say so it's because I'm trying to do what's best for you and it falls within the system you might just be thinking like very like tactically but I'm thinking strategically, like over the course of the whole year. So we're playing our best, like in a New York, like a New Year's six bowl, not yeah. like always, like just when we're going into August. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that, that point can be misconstrued a little bit because it's not like we spend too much time um, teaching or whatever, but I think in, in snippets, you know, you have the ability to kind of have a conversation quickly and, and, and give guys, it's like the Google effect, right? Because everybody's got a computer in their fingertips right now and they can find whatever information at any time. And if our players knew how to ask the right questions, they might be asking the questions in that moment, but they just, they probably don't understand enough about training to ask the right thing other than why. And I think in my career, I have at least been open enough to embrace the whys in the right time. I, I, I have always told either my athletes or my teams that I've been over I will never, there's no dumb question. You can always ask a question. Just don't ask it at the wrong time. If you're asking and I feel like you're trying to draw, draw, drag time on when we have rest periods or whatever, then I'm going to tell you to shut up and we're going to, we'll, we'll have that conversation later, but there's really no wrong question. There's no dumb question. There's no bad time to, 
let you understand. I think that just gives ownership in the program. And I think that's what more in this day and age when you're talking about NIL and you have transfer portal, if you could, the faster you can give ownership and bought into to the, the team, you know, I think that gives the, the ability to have, you know, a, a more full buy-in with some of your players. And, you know, then you have guys that have been in the program that might've stayed for three to four years. And those guys really understand it more fully or can, explain it and then you had then then you had a bigger benefit because you've now showed that one you care because you're trying to explain why we're doing these things that we're doing and two that you know what the hell you're talking about as a practitioner and it's not just like throwing it on the wall and seeing if it sticks like you said and then kind of the third part is you have a, a almost another coach in the room because you've you've got a few of your older guys that have heard you talk about these things and maybe they're now repeating some of the things and that you've said to, to your to your team throughout the years and so you know, because we follow a cycle anyways, even if we change the training program up year to year, it's not going to be that dramatic, you know, over the course of a, a student athlete's lifetime. They're still going to recognize the, the patterns of training and the patterns of the, the in season and the off season. So they have the ability to almost continue to educate. You know, it's like locker room talk. If you're not around, but they, they're still individuals that can kind of uphold what your vision is and what the vision and the point of the training is when those questions arise. And, you know, you got guys that, want to ask why the hell we're doing the things that we're doing yeah you're right that that locker room talk and like having all your athletes like year to year bought into it like your biggest advocates are going to be them and if you can right. turn them into kind of like miniature coaches even if they're just kind of an echo chamber of the stuff that you and the rest of the staff are kind of putting out there like as information even if it's not like death by powerpoint where you're sitting there and like going through the training cycle you're just you're touching them in snippets. Like you can kind of see like based off the relationship and athlete, if they're not really bought in or if they want a little bit more information based off kind of like how they're wording questions or if they're trying to get away with stuff. So if you can just quickly throw that in there, like that's, it's almost like an insecurity from an athlete or that's like some of them, it's a test to see like, Hey, like, does this guy really know what he's doing? Oh, in a sense, like maybe subtly. And when you're able to kind of give it back to him right away, like, you most sometimes you got them right there, like in that moment, yeah. like it, you nipped it in the bud, like it'll never pop up again. And, and that athlete's on your side for good. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. Hey, so kind of talking about like, just like the difference between like the like longevity of an athlete, like kind of starting off their career in college, kind of going through forward and like, hopefully like developing over the course of time and like getting into that starting role. Like as coaches, like we kind of go through those same cycles and you kind of talked about like how your training has developed and kind of like gone forward, like being in the profession for a lot longer and being at so many different stops and everything like you, you've been training for a long time now. So even though you're not kind of getting on the platform, maybe as regularly as you were before, like how do you kind of still keep that like in the forefront of your mind and like making sure that like training it's still a staple like in your like for your health, for your well-being and like just as a coach in general, too. Yeah, I mean, that is probably one of the hardest things to keep up because it's an ebb and flow of time of year and demand. I just think that. Really, personally, if we're going to demand so much out of our student athletes, then we should at least uphold our end of the bargain. So, you know, right now it doesn't look perfect but you know five to six days a week i'm out there we're out there you know with i i try to always find somebody on staff that i can be accountable with um and you know i it was hard for me when i worked for the military i was a contractor for a little while and there were no other staff members that were with me so it was just me one strength coach and the athletic trainer for a while and so you kind of mark out a time of day and i realized really quickly that if i didn't have the discipline of just getting my workout in one i was not as good of a of a husband or a father um, coming home, but also I didn't feel right either just physically. And so I think there's just more of that decision made where I'm always going to do something. And, and there have been points in, in my career too, where I'm kind of at one right now where I don't want to be the one writing the program or I, I need to find a program that, that kind of fits the needs that I kind of want and so, you know, three of us on staff here just recently sat down and were like looking for programs. I'm like, hey, we can sit down and probably write a program faster that fits the things that we need to do and want to do. Then we could find one through all of our files and everything else. So we sat down and wrote out 
essentially, you know, a six day training program that fits our needs where we're sprinting, jumping, doing Olympic movements, uh, you know, doing some conditioning, doing, you know, it's kind of like well-rounded right now, but there's always some emphasis. I, I kind of, I go back to the basics of like breathe hard, lift heavy. And I think that kind of fits in every, every, every single way, do some kind of jumping and sprinting. And I think that is like, you know, it's, it's a little more simplified than the Jan, Dan John approach, but I think Dan John has hit it on the head for like consistency and longevity. But, uh, you know, essentially I still, you know, at 40 want to be doing a lot of athletic things and, and want to be able to move and want to be able to not just be, you know, I think, my student athletes are are surprised when I get out there and I'm demonstrating bounding and showing them getting out of a stance. And, and, you know, it's not just, I know a lot of my Instagram is like the lifting and the having fun in the weight room, but I think that's what people want to see. And I, you know, that's, that's kind of like what the highlights are, but it's also, I'm not putting out, you know, a, a tripod for when I go out on the field and run, you know, my sprint work, but I, I really find value in doing the things that we ask our athletes to do. Um, and it keeps me sharp and it keeps us sharp. And I think as a staff, when you have the ability to do that, even as a group, it also gets you on the same page as far as how you coach under pressure, how you coach other athletes when you're expecting them to be in those same situations when they're either under fatigue or you're asking them to run a, uh, run a repeat sprint or a repeat conditioning run or get under a heavy weight and strain. Um, it really gives you the ability to understand what they're going to go through. And, you know, for, for the, for the majority of my career right now, I can still say that there's not anything that I've asked my athletes to do that I w haven't tried myself or still won't do myself. And hopefully I can continue to do that for a while. Um, you know, I feel great, but just, you know, it's more of, I think one, one accountability and, and finding people that, will challenge you and push you. I have some other strength coaches just across the country, either guys I've worked with in the past um, that actually I want a strength coach, Brandon Garcia and myself right now, he's at Cincinnati, he's assistant at Cincinnati. Every single morning we send each other a, a 20 cal echo bike sprint, max effort. So we'll walk in the right room, put our backpacks down, do a bike sprint and send it to each other. And it was born out of like a conversation that we had and it may be stupid and it's like some days we're like, don't want to do it or like, hey, this one was terrible today. But it's just like, you know, it sparks other conversation about, hey, I wonder what this would look like in training. I wonder what, you know, some other areas that it's just like staying curious on some of the physical demands that are placed on us. So I could tell you probably probably handfuls of stories of things like that with other coaches, either in the building that I'm working with or, you know, across the country where we've just decided that we we're going to do something like that and kept each other accountable. That's probably the biggest motivator that you can have is just somebody else is on, on the road waiting for you and knowing that if you don't do it, somebody else is doing it and, and going to hold you accountable later. So that, that to me is, you know, one of the, the most fun things that just there's some camaraderie around the training and, you know, ability to still be competitive and compete and have some fun with it. Yeah. Those are all great things to have. Like you can kind of get all those things from training partners. Sometimes it's, Sometimes it's harder to come by. It seems like it, it seems counterintuitive for a strength coach to say, like, sometimes I don't want to train or sometimes yeah. you feel like you can't find the time to train or like, why can't you have a training partner? But when sometimes when that's all you're doing or you're like your office is right next to the weight room, it's kind of the last thing you want to do at some point. So to be able to have someone that's probably feeling the same way and going doing the same thing as you having the same kind of step count and like fatigue level and maybe like lack of sleep. It's, it's nice to be like to reach across the room and be like, all right, hold me accountable to this. You hold me accountable or have, have someone in your network like that you're doing and, and send in kind of yeah. snapshots of what you do when you first get to the weight room each day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the the biggest part of that is, you know, not, to, not even to go like Goggins or Jocko or anything like that on it, but it's like, it's the discipline versus motivation talk, right? Like the, the feeling of motivation is really not like you're not going to feel motivated the majority of the time. And especially on the schedule that we're in when we're in the off season, which is a strength coach's end season. Right. Um, you know, but I think there's a demand on you to just continue. And, and we always feel better after we've done it. And so I think just having somebody that holds you accountable 
you know, there's plenty of days where I'll be the first one to walk out and start the training session and just be like, Hey, I'm going, I'm like, all right, everybody puts everything down and they, and they drop it over. And, and if it's 45 minutes, if it's a, you know, a full training session, that could be an hour, hour 15, if whatever time we have. But on the day, what the, the beauty of it is on the days that I don't feel like it, somebody else probably has the energy to at least put a foot on the floor and walk out there. And so you're like, you know, slap your legs, get up and, and you go follow suit because one of the days you're going to be the guy that's kind of pushing too. So that's just the beauty of, of knowing somebody's on the other end is that is the accountability part. And, you know, I can tell you this, when, when if it was just me, I, I would probably much rather sit there for an hour because I'm tired and then I'll eventually get, you know, the motivation to get up or, or, you know, do it. But for the most part, you know, if I'm not doing it in the morning before the day, day, then it's, it, it could be a struggle to get it done in the afternoons. So you know, just having somebody to be able to push you and, and, and drive you a little bit is, is, you know, all the benefit. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely appealing. And that's definitely one thing like I've always yeah. kind of seemed to lack too, like not being on a football staff or not having like the same schedule. Because when you're on small staffs or Olympic staff, sometimes like you're just passing ships with each other and yeah. you're kind of your own coach there, unless you maybe you have some help for a certain day or like myself, like, just training in the storage unit or in my garage. Like, yeah, it's hard. It's uh, like sometimes it's got its perks, but sometimes it's got its drawbacks to that. Like, I mean, just trying to step through the threshold, like my garage is right there. Like how difficult should it be for me to actually like go in there and do it? But then, I mean, when it's 95 and hundred percent humidity and I've already been up for 15 hours, it's a, uh, it's a little bit different to like I kind of want to do that day after day after day, but no, it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing to have like that, that atmosphere, like for the staff, like fo for football and like being able to kind of bounce ideas off of even you guys talk, you talked about like just putting together and constructing a program for um, like you guys in general, like what, when you've, I know you've mostly like worked with football and having like that staff, but like, take me back to kind of like when you were working that contracting job, like with the Marine Corps as well, like, and you were by yourself, like, was that something like, how did you kind of find a way to kind of replace that or continue to stay active and like network with other people and bounce ideas off if, you, if you're the only coach there, because, and I know you've moved around same thing too, with a lot of other uh, positions within strength conditioning for football too, and been on different staffs, like same thing. Like, how do you just kind of, collectively like work with all these different individuals until you're back with the team again. Yeah. I mean, as you were saying that just about your schedule and having the garage there, like that, that made me think about, you know, working for the Marines, you know, that was four and a half years and the first probably year and a half was really difficult because I had a little setup in my home, my house and I was working the contractor schedule. I was starting work at six and I was off by two or two thirty, and, you know, uh, there are plenty of days where I worked, you know, 10 to 12 hours and I would, you know, get in trouble from my the contracting company for logging too many hours. And so I just, I stopped logging, you know, the whatever hours I was actually working and just putting eight hours down. Um, but what I started doing, you know, I was, I think once I get on a schedule and a routine, I'm fine. It, it's more of like starting and figuring out what that routine is going to be. I would, I think I would personally prefer to get up in the morning early train early before the day starts and then have it done and not have to think about it again. Um, and if that's my routine, I'm going to stick to it. And I typically, once it starts, it doesn't break. When I was with the Marine Corps, I had so many other, other things going on that it might get to, you know, two or three o'clock in the afternoon where I'm not supposed to be at work anymore, you know, contractually. And I'm like, all right, well, I can go home and, you know, hang out with my wife and my kid, which I didn't really have when I was working football, you know, for the, four to six years beforehand. Um, and so a lot of days that was, you know, really, you know, desirable to do. And that's kind of like, that was early on enough in my career where I realized that, you know, what type of therapy that felt like to me, like the training was beneficial because I felt better. Um, I kind of got the anxious energy out that I probably needed to. I felt like I was doing what I needed to do to kind of be the, the, you know, practice what you preach type of guy. Um, and, you know, I, I needed that. So I just, I would stick to a schedule. And by by the end of the second year, I had found a group of 
um, guys that, that were Marines at the unit that I was training that came in at a certain time and they were all a lot more experienced um, just with their physical training. And so I began to join them. And so it was like the lunch, the lunchtime crew where I would take my lunch hour and I'd take whatever 90 minutes off of my work schedule, but I would train with those guys. And so it, it was, you know, I might log some hours if I'm like actually coaching the guys, but essentially it was like, I would, I would set up the training. They would all show up. We'd warm together. We train together. And then they would go back to work and I would kind of reopen the weight room for, you know, the groups that I had to train in the afternoon. And I just would work the schedule around that. And, and you know, that was just a much different environment for me when it wasn't, you know, the actual staff that I was working with that's training together. Now, the, the second part of the question was just in transition periods, right? And, you know, taking a new job and working with a new staff. I think that's just organic, right? It's like, who's the guy that gets up early? Who's the guy that trains consistently? Who, you know, who are the guys on staff that, you know, there's always guys that like to train you know, maybe do a little bit here and there. There's guys that like you're surprised that they maybe rarely train. There's guys that don't want to train with anybody. And I think it's just more organic of, you know, who likes with training partners, who likes training with others. And so you kind of just gravitate towards those, those individuals on staff. And more times than not, I will say that I've been involved with the internship program. So I would just kind of force whatever interns, you know, needed experience on the weight room floor and, there's so much more coaching and so much more development of just getting your hands dirty a little bit with the work, whether it's on a barbell or whether it's on the field or whatever, whatever the, the program was that we were kind of, you know, putting ourselves through at the time. Um, and there's been times where I let the interns or we let the interns write the program for us and we critique going through it. And the interns will realize like, this is a really crappy program or I like this and I don't like this, but it, it would be, almost like that immediate feedback of like, yeah, I definitely wouldn't want to do that with a team or a group or this doesn't make sense. So, you know, kind of pulling people along in, into it and, and you didn't utilize that as like a learning tool as well. Um, and that has been really, really beneficial just for younger coaches that I've gotten, you know, further in my career that there's a lot of learning and development that happens in that training environment where you kind of build a, a camaraderie and, and, a, and a group around the training. And then, you know, what you see the benefit of is you, you kind of mold the, co the coaching environment to be a lot like, you know, if you have a really exciting training environment, you're trying to create that for your players, too. And you kind of you kind of give that to the, the, the folks around you. So I think that's been another part is it's been more organic, but it's also been, you know, some of it's been tactical as well with like interns and developing younger coaches and just, you know, pulling people along. Hey, you know, they might not even know that they enjoy training, but they're going to start training and we'll see if they enjoy it or we'll see if, you know, where the learning happens and you don't need everybody to fall in love with it or be, you know, the, uh, the lover of the barbell or lover of everything else. But you might find that somebody has a really distinct ability to, you know, be a, a, a speed guy or be somebody that really enjoys a certain area of training. And I think that's, you know, an area of develop, uh, development that could be missed if it's not put into practice the right way. There's not only so much you can do in like a, classroom learning type environment without getting, you know, getting down and actually participating in some of those drills that you're expecting your student athletes to do, or you need to demonstrate. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's kind of what it comes down to, especially young in your career too. Like you really need, you need some time in the trenches to actually develop those things and really get a understanding and, and real like feel for it. Cause if you don't have that, it's a lot harder for you to, communicate with that with your athletes or be able to kind of make adjustments in your program and stuff. Otherwise you're just writing words and numbers on paper and you really don't yeah. know what's going to happen when like you actually start a training session and see how it's going to impact people because you still got to run the session. You still got to see how people react to it. And especially in a team setting too, like you throw 120 football guys into a room and like that's it's controlled chaos. And if you don't know what you're doing or you don't know how to explain something or you kind of mistime something, it's not controlled anymore. It's just chaos. Right. Absolutely. Hey, so your your career has been wild. Like you've I mean, you've been you've been in it for a while. Like I feel like when I look at your resume, it looks like mine. I mean, you've been in a lot of full time positions and you've been like actually in a crazily a lot, a lot of similar places that I've been too. Um 
But I know like through all those stops and like all those different staffs and working with those people, like have got you to the position you are today, like just kind of learning along the process. Um, you've been you've been a director. You've been in a contract position with the Marine Corps before. You've been a head coach, like kind of in a different position now, like more of a supportive position. Like how important were like those support roles to lead you to like kind of run the ship as like the buck stops here. I'm the head guy. And then like kind of in turn, how does that also kind of that experience as a director taking a step back just for like how kind of how the game of football strength conditioning works? Um, how are you able to kind of like be even a better like supportive role, like assistant director, like in now your current position, knowing that you've you've run the ship before, too? Yeah, I, I think those experiences are everything. And and I think that they're while they're not all created equal, I think the intent of every single position that I've had has been to learn to impact and to prepare for whatever comes next. So I've really tried to be where my feet are in all those positions and not look for what the next step was. And that's not to say that I wasn't trying to prepare for the opportunity, but it wasn't that I was trying to get out of places or leave. And, you know, what, if, if you talk to me, you know, years ago, it might be different, but I, I, I've still looked for stability in my career and for my family, but, you know, I've tried to pursue the opportunities that seemed like the right moves at the right time um, for what I, for what I wanted out of my career. And I, I started off my career, um, you know, wanting to be a head strength coach and really not knowing what that entailed. Um, you know, when I, when I got certified with, uh, the CSCCA, I looked at what the coaches that I respected and I wanted to get my master's of strength conditioning, which I, I achieved this past year, uh, or this year, uh, most recently in May. And, you know, I think that was just what I saw out of staying power from a lot of coaches within, you know, the, the collegiate coaching realm. And so trying to find, follow the model of what those coaches who I considered mentors really were able to accomplish. But I think, Along that way, especially as an assistant for a number of years, trying to think like the head guy, trying to operate and, you know, take as much off of the head guy's plate as possible without seeming like you're trying to be in charge. That's not what it's about. It's not trying to be in charge. It's just being a really good team player. And if there's something that I can alleviate, you know, and, and I try to get a really good understanding of what the demands on the head strength coach were, what they're dealing with administratively, what they're taking from the head football coach, the types of things that, you know, they're, they're privy to that you might not see as an assistant. I tried to understand those things as I was going through it. And to be honest with you, I worked as an assistant or a grad, uh, a grad assistant for six years before I had the opportunity with the Marine Corps. And I saw the Marine Corps opportunity as I was the only strength coach with a battalion of, approximately 500 Marines and sailors, 180 of which were, uh, were special operators. And so I kind of took that as like, I was the head straight coach, even though that wasn't a title of mine, but it kind of, it, it in the Marine Corps, I was considered a, a subject matter expert. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not even 30 years old yet. And I'm considered a subject matter expert. And so I try to at least uphold my end of the bargain as a contractor of trying to provide the best possible service that I was supposed to provide on, on the government's end. And I just began to insert myself in places where I thought needed help. And so then getting back into college certain conditioning, I left there to go back to University of Illinois. And then I got the, a chance to get to the University of Maryland from there and work for a couple of different staffs. And I think always having an open mind and being able to pick up the kind of the nuances of what, what it took to be a really great assistant. And, you know, I think along the way, leading interns, helping the staff get the job done and knowing that it didn't really matter if I got the credit or if we got the credit, I would prefer if we got the credit. And I just, I always wanted us to do, to do a really good job. And I always wanted to make sure that we operated as a team and a unit and, Whenever we got in front of the players, even if we argued about what the program was, it was our program. It was the best program we could put forward for that team at the time. Um, and we were a unified front. And I thought that was a success as an assistant. And I think that led to, you know, over the years, I was really trying to prepare to be a head strength coach. And I was trying to kind of behind the scenes 
make sure that there was nothing missed. Like I didn't want the head strength coach to ask us for anything. I wanted us to always outthink what the next what the next thing was. So so like anticipation was another big piece for me is just having really great attention to detail and anticipate what the needs were going to be. And you know, I felt like those were things that I could convey once I got the opportunity as a head strength coach to my staff I was like, hey, these are the things that I need from you. I need you to have really great attention to detail. I need you to be critical thinkers, solve the problems that, that I that don't need to come to my desk all the time. Like, I'm happy to sit down and have a discussion, but if you can answer this question and solve it, and when I ask you why we did it this way, you can tell me a good reason for it, I'm not going to be upset with you. And so like that was a, that was as as kind of like the leader of my department was what I hope and and you know, hopefully go back and ask my staff that was with me there that that that's what they would say as as well is that it's always it was never you guys versus me or you guys need to do this and I'll do this it was we and even if I wasn't always the biggest part of the we we were always doing this together and this is what was our unified front and I always wanted to be unified from the head football coach all the way down as far as the department's concerned. And now moving back into a role as an assistant on staff, I think the big picture makes more sense having seen it. Now, the one thing you don't get to see as an assistant as frequently is you're probably not in every meeting. You're probably not hearing every single thing that is relayed to you by the coaching staff, the head football coach. But I think, you know, having, having the ability to ask the right questions and having the ability to see kind of the big picture. Sometimes as, as assistants, you might only train a group or a certain number of guys or see a really certain area that you might be over. And just being able to step back and kind of see the big picture, see you know where the training is going, what the team looks like, what the decisions need to be made. If we're adjusting training off of metrics, if we're utilizing um, you know any data to kind of drive our decisions, like those type of things, like, it can't just be, hey, my guys felt great today, so let's push the rest of the team. You're kind of making decisions based on the whole and not just a small percentage. And I think being able to step back and relay that information and maybe even relay a little bit of like, hey, this is why, you know, coaches is seeming stressed today. This is why what he's thinking about. This is what's on his mind. Like, it's not just, you know, this one guy that's bugging him. It's it's this whole situation. I, I think just having the the ability to understand what the big picture looks like, even though it seems like you can do that without having had the experience in that seat and, and being the director. I think it gives you the ability to just think about it, you know, in a less, you know, in an effortless way because you've operated that way for any amount of time. And so I really anticipate if I do have an opportunity to be a head strength coach again, that I'm, you know, kind of already had that experience and there's mistakes that I made and there's things that, you know, I probably wish I would have done differently the first time around, but those are all, learning learning points where I can be better from that from now as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in having every single role and being able to embrace it and being the best at every role and, and that you're in at the time. And that's where I'm at right now is that right here at the University of Maryland, I'm going to embrace the roles that I have and try to uplift those around me and make their jobs easier and try to make sure that, that our staff is operating to its fullest capacity that it can be within within what I'm able to provide. Yeah, that's great. It's and I, I think it's cool too, like to be able to go through all those different places and all the different kind of roles that you did to get you to that head position too. Because, like you said, if you want a really good supportive role and you want a really good assistance, like on your staff as a director, you want them to take things off your plate and like not really bring anything to you unless it's something that they can't kind of do on their own without your help. So going through all those experiences and all those different roles, like gives you kind of an understanding of what kind of whatever you want to call it, like your subordinates are going to be able to like what they do on a day-to-day basis. So then you can focus kind of like on your role and then thinking up and going to talk to the head coaches and talking to administrators and boosters or whatever else that's going to be. And then because you have the trust in your assistants to kind of do the job and hold the fort down, you can kind of just get a status report when you come back and then understand that like the decisions they're making when you're gone are the right ones. And you just want to be filled in and then you fill them in on all the meetings and everything you have. So you're kind of all on the same page, even if they're not always in those. And 
uh, I think you, you've said it a couple times too, like when we talked about athletes training and then now kind of like being an assistant coach, having experience coming back from a director is like, it gives you the ability to ask like right, the right questions. And I think that all comes from experience. Like you're talking to the athletes about like an experience because about training, because you've experienced that training before and like, you know what it feels like and you know why you're doing that type of training and they buy in. And then as an assistant coach, when you're talking to like a director again, and you're asking questions because you're not necessarily privy or in those meetings because only one person's there, you know, the right questions to ask because you've been in that, in that seat before so that you're not kind of wasting your time beating around the bush. You're like, this is exactly what I need to know. So yeah, it's, it's huge to know that, but it, it's the, it's kind of the age old thing of like, you don't get the job unless you have experience. Like, how do you kind of, how do you kind of gain maybe those like nuanced experiences ahead of being a head coach? Like, I know you talked about some of the responsibilities that were new to you when you kind of got into that role and maybe you don't necessarily do a whole lot of now, but how did you kind of like, is it just, you got to wait till you get there? Because if that's the case, admin shouldn't hire anybody ever <laughs> because right. unless they've already been a coach, a head coach before. I, I actually have an answer for this and it, it's maybe a little vague, but it's, it is the same to me as I call it being ready versus being prepared. And it's like when, when my wife was pregnant with our first kid, everybody, like, are you ready? Are you ready? And you're like, no, I'm not ready. Like, I don't know what I've never had a kid before, but you're as prepared as you can be because you're trying to do the things to be, to, to have to be ready to have this kid right and so in the same way and not it's not it's not the same thing but i always say the ready versus prepared statement because you're never going to be ready for that next thing and there's always going to be something that surprises you even if you know i've had almost 18 years of coaching experience now i've been in it for, since 2006 in some capacity and there's there's still things that are, are a little bit different in every situation, based on the individual, based on what's happened, whether it's good or bad. Um, and so, but you can be prepared to have a response or you can be prepared to, to, to at least react to a situation um, or be proactive in a situation because you've seen the pattern before. Or, And I think that's what you're talking about where maybe I'm not going to be able to sit with administrators, but I ask the questions of like, hey, when, when my boss goes and has has meetings about contracts or has meetings about you know is talking to donors about um about money or about giving to the program because we need a certain amount of money to buy things those are the questions that i'm asking how are you how are you approaching these conversations what type of things are you guys discussing how are you setting up um you know next steps for you how are you setting up the you know these meetings and what are you thinking going into it even if i really know what how i would do it or i think i would do it a certain way I'm always interested in what somebody else's perception or vision of, you know, how, how these, these certain, you know, responses, meetings, reactions go, because that could be something that's beneficial to me in the future or, or something that I haven't ever thought about that could benefit me in the future as well. So it's not always that, Hey, you've reached a certain point in your career. You're just ready to do it because I know for sure there's plenty of coaches out there that are happy to just coach their group, get a little lift in and be done. And, you know, they cross their fingers that they're going to get a job uh, or they're going to be able to, to kind of move up or they're happy being in their role. I just, I think if you aspire to, to be in that seat, then you need to prepare yourself by being really engaged in what's going on. It's not like, Hey, just the boss is going up to meet with the coaching staff. That's what he does. And then, you know, you, you don't engage the, the head strength coach, when he comes back, you ask about what was talked about in the meeting. You ask for like a little bit of a debrief. You kind of, Hey, what's, you know, what's the vibe today? What are the coaches about? Talk to, talk to the other coaches. You, you gain relationships, not only with the players, but some of the staff. And there's a way to do that respectfully, not taking away other coaches time, not looking like you're just trying to be in somebody's hip pocket um, that, you know, a coach that might be on the up and up that you're just trying to, you know, suck up to and, and, hopefully be that guy's guy later on. I think there's a way to do that and be engaged to actually benefit the program 
but also to serve the purpose of preparing you to know how to have those conversations, what those look like down the line. Um, because if you never talk to a position coach about their players and you train their players, that's kind of silly to me that you haven't, you know, at least be able to brief that. It, that might also not be what your boss prefers the way for you to operate. And so I understand that that's different on staffs as well. But I think if you handle those things in a mature way and you have pure intent, then it's not something that looks like, you know, it's political. You know, I, I think some of those things can seem like you, you're posturing and you're trying to, there's a reason that you're asking those questions. If you're genuinely caring about what those, the answers to those questions are and how people are thinking about their responses and how, how they're operating outside of the scope of just being in the weight room or being on the field and training the team, then you're going to gain a lot of experience just from listening and learning. Yeah, that's a great point. That's, I mean, it's, it's good to kind of like be engaged and then actually like ask those questions because it shows that like you're, you're super interested in what's going on with the program. And even though maybe you don't have a seat at the table, like for those conversations, like you want as much information as possible because I mean, all that is going to be helpful and drive some of the decisions or kind of sway what you guys do moving forward. And if you're all on the same page and speaking the same language, like that's huge. So does that, does that posturing, do you see that posturing start happen more and more? Like, I know it's, it's kind of a goofy world where it's like, like position coach, everybody's kind of like, Hey, who's going to the next move? Like there's changes happening all in college. Like, do you see it in some of the younger like interns and like group coming up? Or is it just kind of like, you get a feeling if someone's doing that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't say, I know that there's that, that it's out there. I just, I think with interns, you can determine whether their intentions are to get experience or they want to get on staff to get close to a coaching staff to, you know, they want to be in coaching. And they're, and you just direct them like, hey, this is not, strength and conditioning is probably not for you if you want to be on the field coach, unless that's something that the, that the head strength coach wants and doesn't care about. But I think also, you kind of get a feeling of, and this is to me too, like your players are going to figure out real quick whether you're real or not, right? And it's, you know, you can only hold up a front for so long on being, you know, a, a fake person versus a real person. So if that's all you're in it for, somebody's going to find you out. And, you know, I don't ever want to be that. I want to be, you know, somebody that's desire desirable to be a, on staff with another coach because of the job that I do and because of the coach that I am and the person that I am to our student athletes and to the other staff. So, you know, to me, it's not about like posturing and I don't, I don't really pay attention to the games a whole lot. Um, you know, talk to the people that you need to talk to that help, help make the decisions for the best of our you know team and our players and, you know, kind of do the best job you can where your feet are. So to me, it's like, I don't even pay attention to some of that stuff and it probably happens more often than, you know, I, I would probably have been really naive to those things in my younger years of coaching, not really realizing that that was probably what I needed, you know, what I needed to be doing in the eyes of what the profession says is like getting really close to the position coaches. Whereas, you know, the majority of my career has been spent on getting really close to the team. So I know the team, so we can train the team well, get the team back to play games on Saturday, train them really hard, you know, let them lean into the training. Like those types of things were really valuable to me you know, less, less so much the political side of getting a job. Like I'm going to be happy and do the best job that I can wherever I'm at, whatever level, whatever position, whatever place. And so, you know, want to be blessed with an opportunity. That's great. But, you know, if not, I'm going to continue to be where my feet are and, and do the best job that I possibly can there. Yeah. I love that. I mean, just let the work speak for yourself and then let, let your relationship with the athletes and what you do with them kind of be the biggest vocal thing that's kind of standing out and what really defines you. It's a, it's a tough world when like obviously wins and losses and like how the coaches feel about you or, or where kind of decisions are being made or, or what, whatever powers above you be are the ones that kind of drive it versus like, Hey, what do the athletes think? Because that's, I mean, that's who, if we talk about student athlete experience, we talk about who's the predominant factor when it comes to like the success of athletics, it's those athletes that are actually playing the game. So I don't understand why. And that's a, that's a rabbit hole to figure out exactly. Like, no, I think it is for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's that one, that one might get a little bit too much, but Hey, on that, <laughs> on that topic though, of like kind of the young coaches and everything kind of coming up in the profession, like you had some defining moments of like kind of 
like having coach Gentry around and like your football experience and staying on as a GA there. And that really kind of drove your decision and like getting involved with powerlifting, like to really stay and like make a career in college, like strength and conditioning. Like what, what do you think is like maybe some of the most important advice that you can kind of give a young coach that's going into like really, really like tell them like, Hey, if you really want to be in this profession, like this is something you need to know. And if not, if you're not willing to like kind of make this sacrifice or do this sort of thing, like maybe this isn't the profession for you and to look maybe elsewhere. Well, I think the first thing to understand just about getting into collegiate strength and conditioning is that it's not, there's no glitz and glamour. I think it, it's, it's all about the student athlete. It is a service-based industry. You are there to serve the student athlete. You are there to provide a service. You are there to essentially help with recruiting, continue to recruit the players that you have in the program to develop them and to develop young men, especially on the football side. So I think from, from that area, if, if you're not into that and your heart's not out for athletes, you don't have to have that philosophy now. But I think in some form or fashion, you have to know that you really enjoy the training. And, and that's great that, like, you know, you get a lot of interns that, like, hey, I love being in the weight room, and that's cool. I think that it took me a while to develop what my, you know, quote-unquote personal philosophy was. But I think they're in kind of the interest of, you, you know, a little bit of the self-searching, soul-searching side of this thing is you have to kind of have a – begin to create a why. And that doesn't need to stick with you for the entire time, but I think you have to be on the floor, and if you think it's something that – could potentially interest you, you need to go somewhere and get experience and see if that it, it's for you. And I, I don't think all experiences are created equal. I think there are some really great developers, uh, developers of young coaches. So ask, being able to ask the right questions um, is a skill as well. So early on to young coaches or aspiring coaches, reaching out to a lot of coaches and trying to have conversations. Social media has made everybody available through DMs, through emails, whatever, I have tried to always return emails or text messages or opportunities to speak, even if we're in the off season. I've got like three unread text messages right now on my phone from other coaches that I will get back to and need to get back to. So hopefully by the time this airs, I will have at least gotten back with those three guys and then and more. But I can't tell you how many times over the years that somebody's reached out about interning or just having questions and even if it's not a right fit for where I'm at right now, I want to help connect people that seem passionate about it with somebody that might help them that I know are good developer of people. So get a, get a read on what this young coach or young aspiring coach is, you know, about. And if they seem like somebody that's legitimate or actually, you know, not to, to sound unfair, but worth somebody's time, then I want to send them the right way so they can get developed. And, and you know, so a lot of self-education putting your head in the books, reading about the basic, you know, tenets of strength and conditioning, getting in the fundamentals textbook, from the NSCA, you know, all those things are great foundational. I found myself not, you know, diving into, you know, philosophy and methods so much anymore, but that's not where I'm at in my need for my career. But I think that knowing enough of just the basic science and the, and the reasoning of, you know, programming and things like that early on is, is a huge benefit. And so, you know, being able to have a network, being able to, to, to speak to people and ask questions and then not stopping. And the biggest thing that I see from interns these days is they're afraid to ask questions. They're afraid to, you know, pe a lot of the interns that I've seen have bad experiences is because they didn't engage on their end. They were expected to kind of do the intern jobs or help with the intern responsibilities, which suck essentially because if you're not getting something on the back end, right? If you're not getting... The development if you're not asking questions i think there's there's an ebb and flow with the time of year as well you know I, I think no matter what it's really hard in the summer to get a full experience from the internship program just because of how high the the staff is running throughout the year but if you intern through a spring or through a fall you're going to get a ton of development um and, so, and as well as the winter is like the summer as well um so but the engaging and, and asking questions, if you're with the right staff and you're with the right people, I've had more beneficial conversations just sitting down and talking, training or talking uh, about the profession with interns in my office that went from like one question that spanned to a discussion for two hours than we did when we have 
a directed curriculum in that springtime or that fall, right? Where they're learning about certain things every single week or a couple of times a week. We have an actual sit down with the intern group um, on, on areas of development, which is what we do. But I think just re-engaging from their end and, you know, not being afraid to ask a question that might sound, you know, like it's too basic for a strength coach that has experience. Like, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe if you've got a question, you need to get it answered and figure out kind of where you're at. So to me, it's just engaging in your own learning and your own education uh, in that same way. And I think just that's, that's passion is just showing a willingness to learn, being eager to show up to work every single day and do a great job. And that could go out to full-time strength coaches too still having an, a, a willingness to learn and being eager to show up to work and do a really good job. And I think there's a lot of coaches that as they have grown in their responsibilities or gained more experience, get too big for certain jobs. And I, I don't think that there's any job too small. If it's important to us to turn plates or to clean the weight room or to dust or to do whatever, then it shouldn't always only fall on the lowest person on totem pole. That should be a job for us. And so there's times where the responsibility might be put upon, you know, the, the lower on the totem pole, so to speak, but it shouldn't be the only thing that, that, you know, one group of individuals in the program is, is expected to do all the time, um, just in the landscape of responsibility. So I think there's, there's some, something there just, you know, not just for the young coach, but I think, showing that passion and showing that eagerness and willingness and uh, throughout your career continues to help, you know, drive a, a little bit of that mentality, like a growth, a growth mindset. Yeah. That's, that's a good way to kind of like sum it up too, because although it applies to a lot of young coaches, like early in their career, like that, that mentality and that approach, like that growth mindset should be carried up forward. Like as you still keep coaching, if, if this is a servant based industry and we're always looking out for the student athletes and we're always trying to get better as coaches and practitioners, like you have to have and exhibit all of those things and kind of be asking questions. Even if you're a full, if you're a full-time coach, if you're the director, you're still asking questions all the time. You're trying to ask the right ones. You're trying to be inquisitive and make sure you're having meaningful discussions and developing relationships. And I think we harp on that stuff when we talk to young coaches so much just because it's kind of novel to them and they're not as well versed in it yet. And it's not to say that like we can't still get better at those things and we don't do that on a day to day basis, but it's almost the same as kind of like the cleaning and all that stuff. Like, yeah, a director can get down in there and clean too and like get involved in everything. But the reason why we put some of the young coaches and interns in it, because we've already had you've had 18 years of experience doing it. This this intern doesn't even have 18 days yet. So how are they going to appreciate the job that you they could potentially be in in 18 years if they don't understand, like, why the weight room set up this way, why we do these sort of things, like why why we're having these conversations and why, like, asking the right questions is important. That's why we kind of harp on those, like, the same as training, all the fundamentals. That's what's going to get them to the point where it's consistently getting better. So when they add our full time, like, it's it's kind of it's not easier, but it's they're more experienced in that manner. Sure. Absolutely. Hey, so coach, I know, I know you got a lot going on. So like, like any good training session, uh, we got to wrap it up and we end it with a finisher. So just like football, I got four quarters, four questions, and hopefully, yeah. hopefully Maryland's got no overtimes this year, but if they do, <laughs> you, you, you come out on top with some wins. So you can go rapid fire or you could take your time on any, but you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right, first one I got for you, biggest influence in strength and conditioning profession and favorite athlete growing up? I'm going to say Mike Gentry, biggest influence. Uh, number one, I could rattle off a ton of other strength coaches, but by far, you know, got to play for him for five years and then GA under him for, for two more. So it's one of the most consistent personalities um, in my time frame. Probably biggest uh, or favorite athlete growing up. Um, was was a product of the 80s and 90s and saw kind of the uprising of Michael Jordan. And so I'm not going to get into who's the best basketball player because I don't really watch basketball anymore. But that guy got to see the the kind of the the uh, totality of all of his championships and everything else. And probably, you know, one of my most favorite memories is just watching him 
um, play through, throughout his the majority of his career. All right, two two good ones. When you're not uh, when you're not coaching and you got some time outside the weight room, what are some of your hobbies that you're kind of interested in or keep you recharged? Definitely the recharge is my family. I've got four kids, uh, three girls and a boy. So spending time with them playing. We also implement pizza nights. So we make, my wife and I make pizza dough, pizza sauce from scratch. And usually that's camaraderie fellowship with either neighbors or staff members or whoever. And so that's, that's like kind of the number one thing is being in the kitchen, cooking a good meal for people, feeding others um, is definitely kind of like the time away. And that's something that we have really enjoyed doing over the course of our years. I like it. Hey, so if you weren't coaching, what do you think you might be doing as a career if that wasn't an option? I always joke about this, but I, I would love to have a, a pizza truck, you know, have a pizza oven in a truck, be a mobile, you know, be like a food truck guy. Um, there's probably plenty of other things that, you know, I could do. Um, but I, as far as like something that I think would be fun, I think that still has the added pressure of the time element. I kind of like to <laughs> work in the weight room and a little bit of a demand and, you know, a little unsure, unsure environment. I think that's, that's kind of like, you know, you got the heat from the oven in the truck too. So you know, definitely the food service industry shares a lot of the same things as strength and conditioning. I think, you know, being being long enough in this career, I think I'd be able to, to handle my own there. Oh, for sure. And you know exactly where to park it on game day. So that's <laughs> you're right. You'll Absolutely. be good to go. Hey, so if you're the first one out of the office and it's a good training day, what is like the music that you putting on the radio and what's the best post training meal after that training session look like? I think it depends on the day. I, I love to go in themes and I, I don't, I will listen to anything and everything, literally anything and everything when I'm training. I think if it's a day where we're training heavy, it's going to be some kind of metal or like, you know, two thousands rap, something like that, where, where it's got, you know, everything from East coast to West coast, um, anything from like a cardio day or conditioning day. I love some of like the EDM type stuff, but you know, any, Anything up and down the spectrum, you can catch me on it. And some day at times I, I might, you know, switch it up on everybody and, you know, they won't know. But um, as far as that's concerned, if I'm on, if I'm on the ox, I'm not sure th there's really no telling what's going to happen. Um, the favorite meal post training, my favorite meal alone is meatloaf and mashed potatoes. So you've got your carbs, you've got, your, you've got your meat. I think that's something that I would love to come home to and have, after a big training day, because that, that's pro there's probably like no end in sight. I could continue to eat that. You know, any, anybody that makes a good meatloaf and mashed potatoes, that, that is like one thing for me. All right. That might be the first one, but that's a good one for sure. Hey, <laughs> last one I got for you for overtime. Uh, either your favorite one or the first one that comes to mind of favorite under the bar or coaching memory you've had so far in your career. Let's see. Under the bar memory, um, probably competing in the North Carolina State Championships for strongman, and on the powerlifting side, uh, winning the uh, the battle on the border, getting first place in the two seventy five division. I think it was like two thousand ten or eleven, something like that. It was the first and the only equipped meet that I ever did. It was single ply meet and hit some really big numbers. I'd never like trained or lifted in in like a squat suit and bench shirt before and i couldn't get the deadlift suit on so i just hit some really really big numbers that were fun to see on the barbell that you know i probably won't ever hit again just because i was definitely not as strong as i am uh then right now but i had decent technique in the in the gear so it was fun that way um favorite coaching memory probably winning back-to-back -back conference championships at East Carolina in football and then also winning um, and winning our conference and going to super regionals with baseball as well as the, the head straight coach for baseball for four and a half years while I was at ECU too. So um, had some really successful years there with multiple sports that were just really fun to be a part of good teams. That's awesome. Yeah. Those, those are definitely some cool memories. I know you've, you've accrued a ton over your career and uh, like, yeah, there's there's no fun way to ever put on a deadlift suit. So trust me, like uh, <laughs> mine mine is folded up or s somewhere in the garage, and I haven't touched yeah. it in in a couple years, and it's probably gonna stay yeah. there until another 
like max deadlift pops up it's probably not give, it, give it to somebody else that's what i said i just put a belt on if i need it that's all yeah it's not happening but hey coach <laughs> i really appreciate you taking the time to come on today um for anybody that's got follow-up questions for you uh want to reach out and obviously like choose your questions wisely even though he's 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 out there like willing to help like be smart about this um <laughs> Where where can they can I get a hold of you and then kind of follow the Terps around for the, for this upcoming football season too? I would say the best place is either on Twitter now X and Instagram the same handle it's Coach M Baggett and that's two G's and two T's for Baggett and I'm sure it'll be spelled correctly in the the, the notes or, or tagged along but I, um, anywhere anywhere on those two I will respond to any messages. Um, not the best with emails so I'd rather respond to a DM so find find me on Instagram or, or Twitter. Perfect. Yeah. Well, don't worry. I got you. I got the spelling. We got it down. But like I said, coach, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on today. It was awesome to get a hold of you and talk. And I know we're in two different spots since the last time we got a chance to talk. So uh, I, I appreciate your time today. It's been awesome. Oh, man, it, it, this was a really great conversation. I really appreciate you having me out. Nick. Of course, coach. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. That's it for this episode of the strength game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachO'Brien.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.